So I'll conduct a comparative analysis of agricultural firms in Arica that produce for distinct markets to examine how state uh, regulation has affected their labor practices and competitiveness strategies, um, particularly looking at uh, the seed industry, which is uh, exported almost 100%, and uh, in the national market, I'll look at tomatoes and olives. So much of the literature on labor in the agricultural sector is focused on how globalization has affected agro-export firms and their workers, leaving open the question of what happens to firms and workers who continue to produce for the national market. By examining agricultural crops uh, that are produced for different markets under different regulatory frameworks, I'll address the role that these factors play in shaping labor regimes and gender regimes. So this study challenges the assumption that export markets are more exploitative than, than local ones by highlighting the mechanisms that contribute to the vulnerability of employment for workers producing for the national market. So I have three primary and um, areas of inquiry. So the first one is the regulatory and legal uh, environment. So I look at um, how rules, laws, and trade packs and migration policies shape the creation of ideal workers and ideal labor regimes, um, how these processes are gendered, and if they vary by the size of the firm. I also look at agricultural production as a highly competitive and globalized marketplace. And in that, I'm interested in knowing um, how, is the market, how is the labor market shaped by the nature of the commodity and the competitive pressures faced by the firm. And also why Chilean workers predominate in agricultural production for export, but immigrant workers are the majority on farms producing for national consumption. And finally, the importance of place. So how does the history of place-specific socioeconomic and political relations shape local labor markets and opportunities for workers' agency and resistance? So a few uh, key theoretical concepts lots of text here. <laughs> um, so research on segmented labor markets has focused on how work is organized, how jobs are structured, and how the working class is divided. But it's placed less emphasis on the relationship between labor, labor force segmentation and socio-political inequities outside the labor market. Today's firms confront a workforce not only segmented by ethnicity and gender, but also, also by citizenship and legality. So the local labor market and labor market segmentation theories. Peck proposes a fourth generation of segmentation theory that describes labor markets as embedded in communities and institutions. Firms use the patterns of gender and ethnic discrimination within these institutions and communities to find sources of labor that are both cheap and controllable. The resulting framework emphasizes the particular ways that local labor markets are socially regulated at the local level in addition to national and global levels. So like I said, my um, study is focused in northern Chile, in the Sapa Valley, um, where agriculture has generally been um, very regional, and uh, the profits have been low, and regulations have been poorly enforced. It's also interesting that indigenous immigrant labor um, make up about 70% of the agricultural labor force. Like I said, I'm interested in how firms use gender, ethnicity, and citizenship to reconfigure their workforce shape local labor markets, and maximize productivity. So you might ask why areca and why these crops? So horticultural production, um, tomatoes and olives, are produced by small to medium-sized firms for the national market. Yet within the last five years, um, there's been an influx of large transnational seed companies that produce exclusively for the export market. Um, these crops are unique in that they produce almost exclusively for either the export market or the Chilean market, and there's no spillover effect, which makes it really um, great case to study because Chile is mainly known for fruit um, export, but there's a lot of spillover. A lot of the what doesn't go to the export market stays in the national market, so you can't really um, look at one or the other. Um, this site also offers an opportunity to examine the effects of different migration policies for Bolivians and Peruvians and the interaction between labor and migration regulations. Um, so just a little more information on the national market firms. So tomatoes, um, so I looked at all of these different uh, pro um, crops and I, I was interested in seeing what type of labor uh, re regime they used. So I found it very interesting that in tomato production they used uh, sharecropping and mainly in family arrangements and most of these people um, happen to be Bolivian families. 
Um, so why is sharecropping interesting? Um, sharecropping, so in one of the ways that, one of the paradoxical ways that some firms are responding to new forms of regulation, agriculture firms producing tomatoes for the Chilean market are able to use modernized labor laws to reconstruct what, would, what some would see as a pre-capitalist form of production, which is sharecropping. Um, because they're not necessarily calling them sharecroppers, they're calling them independent contractors. <laughs> um, and in calling them independent contractors, they are able to avoid uh, much uh, regulation, labor regulation, which basically means they can avoid uh, minimum wage standards. Um, and it also gives them access to unpaid family labor, uh, women and children, intensifying the precarious nature of women's employment and livelihood strategies since they're not employed. And perhaps um, affecting children's uh, ability to uh, seek education. So the other national market firms I'm looking at are Olives. Um, I see what I mainly saw was um, temporary laborers coming from Peru. Um, firms are looking to migration policies to add flexibility to their employment practices. So firms uh, seem to be giving hiring preference to Peruvian migrants who cross the border as tourists for periods of seven days. And um, despite being in the country legally, they don't have uh, legal permission to work. And I'll talk about this a little bit later when I talk about um, migration policies and how it's different for Peruvians and Bolivians. So the export market firms, um, like I said, seed production. Um, so I talked to them about their labor, and they said when they first started, um, they had more immigrant laborers, but now they're really trying to just focus on local Chilean wage laborers. And they also highlighted uh, gender division of labor, um, the types of jobs that women do, and the types of jobs that men do. So there's a greater compliance with labor and migration laws among these firms. Um, firms paid more than the minimum wage to attract a skilled uh, workforce, and they actually have a sector-wide agreement to pay more than the minimum wage. They've kind of met as a seed association and established what they would pay workers. Um, so multinational companies may choose to incorporate some regulatory aspects from their country of origin, which in this case is the US, um, to ensure the smooth functioning of the broader commodity chain and protect their international reputation or incorporate more direct production controls that ensure maximum uh, productivity. So place, in case you aren't familiar with Chile, obviously this is Chile, the part, and I'm not tall enough to do this, <laughs> as <laughs> neither as anyone else in this room, but the part I'm looking at is the very top there, Arica, you can see it, Peru, Bolivia, that area um, is where the production is located. And why is this interesting? So this I actually can point to. Um, so this area, which is, this is the border of Chile. This area right here is the Aymara um, indigenous area, mainly. Um, and notice it just <laughs> right, is right where um, agricultural labor in this valley is uh, concentrated. So the context of migration. So over the last 10 years, immigration um, from Peru has, uh, to Chile has increased uh, nearly 300%. So more, and more than 50% of the foreign population residing in Chile is from bordering countries. Um, it's interesting to note that 20,000 irregular immigrants uh, between Arica and Antofagasta, Antofagasta alone, um, which is Antofagasta and Arica, right here, just this area alone has, they estimate to have uh, 20,000 um, irregular immigrants. Um, this is despite an amnesty uh, in 2007 that benefited 34,000 Peruvians among others. Um, it's also, so the, this is a border that um, shifted in 1879. So this part of Chile actually was previously part of Peru and Bolivia. Um, there's also a law um, that caps the percentage of foreign employees in Chilean firms at 15%, yet small firms are exempt from this law. Um, and most of the producers of tomatoes and olives are small to medium-sized firms, so they can kind of get around this, whereas the seed companies, it's more, much more difficult for them. So migration policies. So in 2000, in December of 2005, Chile inaugurated a bilateral agreement with Peru and with uh, Bolivia 
on um, border crossings, it basically made it easier for them to cross, supposedly made it easier for them to cross the border because now they could cross with their national ID cards as opposed to having a passport. But it still meant that they, have to, that they had to prove um, economic sustainability um, in order to cross. So they basically had to uh, get a visa anyway. Um, yet in, 2000, in November of 2009, the agreement with Bolivia was expanded as part of a side agreement with Mercosur that enabled Bolivians, because Bolivians and Chileans are associate members of Mercosur, to apply for visas without documenting their economic situation. So this is huge for Bolivians. Um, it makes uh, crossing the border to Chile much easier. It also makes applying for work visas and um, tourist visas much easier. There's a lot less paperwork required. They don't have to prove economic sustainability. And their tourist visa um, is automatically for 90 days. So this is not the case for Peru because Peruvian, Peru is not <coughs> a part of uh, Mercosur. So Peruvians can cross the border as tourists and in theory receive a 90-day uh, visa but they often don't do it because they need to prove, uh, they need to document their economic situation. So in practice, Peruvians uh, cross the border using a 1931 uh, border agreement that offers a seven-day tourist permission without economic documentation, but limits their physical mobility and does not allow them to work. So when I say limits their physical mobility, I mean that they actually cannot go, so here's, Here's Peru. They cross the border. They're limited. Unfortunately, it's not on this map, but um, Iquique is right here, which is a bigger, a bigger city. They can't go past. They can't go to Iquique. They're really limited to this area, which there isn't much in terms of like economic development or jobs. Um, that they could possibly do there. It really was meant as a side agreement to like, you can cross the border, buy things, and come back, right? And you have seven days to do it, and you're a tourist. Um, but people are using this, of course, to cross the border, because crossing the border is very easy. It's about $5 you get in a, in a shared taxi. Um, you know, with five or six other people, you cross the border, they stop at the border, you get out, you get your paper stamped, you get in the same car, which is amazing, love this, and then you keep going um, to the other country. So it's fairly easy, it's fairly cheap. Um, you can do it in probably two hours, um, including getting your paper stamped, unless there's a huge line. So people, what they're doing is, um, they're just doing that every week, or they're simply overstaying their, their visa, right? So a little bit about the summer research I conducted in 2011. I um, mainly conducted interviews with uh, NGOs, uh, government officials, um, and firm managers. I did site visits. Um, I toured production sites in Asapa Valley Farms. So I visited two uh, large transnational seed companies and a very large uh, tomato and olive producing firm. I also was interested in looking at um, sending communities, like migration sending communities. So I went to uh, Puno is a main, uh, the, the smaller towns along the south shore of uh, Lake Titicaca are the main sending uh, sites. So I visited these communities. I also did da uh, data collection. Um, while, while there is some data on migration, a lot of it is not available very easily. So it's a lot of, uh, <laughs> A lot of meeting with people trying to get the data that's supposed to be actually public uh, accessible. Um, and Chile has a transparency a law that actually enables you to <laughs> solicit this information and they supposedly have to respond to you by X number of days. Well, you do that and you still didn't get the information. So I met a lot of times with the um, international police. Um, and sat in their office until they shared a PowerPoint presentation with me. They're like, oh, I'll send it to you. I'm like, I have a pen drive. Um, so I actually was able to get a lot of interesting data on, um, on that. I also worked with the Jesuit Migration Service, um, who started, they started an office there only a few years ago, and they have also compiled a lot of uh, interesting statistics. I was initially thinking I would apply a survey um, kind of to test an adapted version of the ethno survey from the Latin American Migration Project. But given time constraints, I just wasn't able to do that on this visit. So what did I find? Um, 
a lot of the findings have actually been in the PowerPoint presentation, but I was really, I wasn't, I didn't really know how, um, from my first visit, how the differences in migration policies actually impacted who was coming. And, and because people say, oh, yeah, they just come with a tourist visa. But I didn't understand that now, since 2009, that's actually changed a lot for Peruvians and Bolivians. Initially, I had thought that the um, Bolivians were in a much, uh, much more disadvantaged than Peruvians. But policy-wise, that's not true. Um, but there is a lot of discourse around why people prefer to hire Bolivians, and it's not because of the um, migration. It's not because they can become legal workers easier. Um, interestingly, there is kind of a view that they're, they complain less, um, they're more docile workers. Um, it's also interesting to find that a lot of Bolivians come to stay to Chile. They, um, they don't migrate alone. Generally, they come in families. <coughs> And they work in families as well. Um, also finding that there, there seems to be uh, differences um, in market, like who you're producing for. Initially, I thought that some of that difference would come out because of agricultural certifications, like uh, that a lot of export uh, fruits and vegetables require. But because these seeds, the seeds in this valley are actually produced for research and not, um, they aren't required to follow those protocols, so that actually doesn't impact why they hire Chileans as opposed to immigrant workers. Um, and probably the more interesting thing I found was about the three-tiered um, labor regime system, that different crops use different types of regimes, that it's pretty much everyone I saw producing um, tomatoes, preferred sharecropping, and that day labor that day labor was used a lot in olives, and that people and that seed companies were hiring predominantly Chilean workers in semi-permanent like contracts. And that's actually where more women were present in the seed company than anything else. So like I said, this is preliminary. It's part of a larger dissertation. Um, hopefully, I will continue later. But in the meantime, I want to thank uh, Lassies, and also because they funded part of this research as well. Um, so that's it. Good morning, everyone. I'd just like to reiterate um, many thanks for being here, and as well, Jamie and Hamona for putting this wonderful conference together. Um, to jump right into things, I'm going to be talking about Chinese labor migrants in Puerto Rico in the 19th century. Um, so I want to talk about it in three ways. First, providing you with some ample context to talk about how these labor migrants end up in Puerto Rico. And that inevitably will take us into a discussion about their presence in Cuba and then ultimately in Puerto Rico. So you'll notice that throughout this presentation. Um, and the, the presentation is based on a singular set of historical data, inmate files from the Archivo General de Puerto Rico. Um, so it's not a very dynamic methodology, but I think there's a lot that we could uh, extract or take out from inmate files to try to rehydrate the context in which I'm interested in given the difficulties uh, in terms of methodology for studying the 19th century in Latin America, for example. And then finally, um, I would like us to perhaps reflect theoretically on some of the issues I raised. I'm still working through the idea, so I'm curious to see what you think about it, uh, this theme, and maybe how the uh, diasporic lens could, could bring out some more meaning. So in the wake of the Haitian Revolution, Jamaica, Cuba, and Puerto Rico became major centers of sugar production in the Caribbean. These societies responded to what historian Christopher Schmidt Nawada calls the Atlantic world's second slavery, meaning societies that responded to expanded European demand for staple goods through the mobilization of slave labor in the 19th century. The 19th century in particular belonged to Cuba, though, the new pearl of the Antilles. The rebirth of Spanish plantation economies occurred 
at a somewhat inopportune time. With the, abolition of ra with the abolition of racial slavery in the British colonies in the 1830s, planters based in the Spanish Caribbean faced new challenges, such as fluctuating slave prices, persistent slave conspiracies, international pressure to abolish slavery, and so on. To offset the diminished flow of enslaved cargo crossing the Atlantic, Cuban planters pursued Chinese labor contracted under penal sanctions. Spaniards, Cubans, Peruvians, and Puerto Ricans used the terms colonos asiáticos, chinos, and chinos contratados to refer to laborers of Asian descent. The English adopted the now famous word coolie. The term coolie may have Hindi Indian origins, specifically the term kolai, which refers to a tribe or agricultural day laborers. Chinese and Indian laborers did not go by this nomenclature, of course. The category was imposed on them and took on a different significance in the context of racial slavery in the United States when the term became associated with low wages, moral corruption, and an incapacity to assimilate into a whole society. Cooley also distinguished agricultural laborers from the cultured Asians that traveled to the Americas as diplomats and merchants. And of course, I put culture in quotes. As historian Benjamin Nicolas Nalbes notes, invoking the term coolie connotes a specific experience then in the history of the Chinese diaspora, and I would argue the broader Asian diaspora. The Chinese earned a positive reputation for sugar cultivation because they had assisted in developing the industries of Java, Sumatra, and Penang in Southeast Asia in the preceding century. Recognition of Chinese expertise in sugar production coincided with British efforts to establish the coolie trade. Trade brokers believed coolies would fill the labor needs of an increasingly free Caribbean. The coolie trade flourished for nearly 30 years, 1847 to 1874, reaching its peak in the 1860s and early 1870s. More than 200,000 Chinese laborers arrived in Latin America and the Caribbean during this period, many under core circumstances similar to those typical of, African, of the African slave trade. They settled primarily in Cuba and Peru, but also other parts of the region. Most immigrated from China's populated coastal provinces, especially Fukiang and Kwantung in the southeast, which is this area down here. Cantonese from English Hong Kong and Portuguese Macau constituted the majority, though other ethnic groups departed from alternative ports as well. And here we see Macau, Hong Kong, Canton, Nestle, in this area, Suato, Amoy, and this being sort of the out boundary of where most of these laborers were coming from. 19th century China was plagued by social and economic chaos. The Manchus or Qing dynasty initially thrived because they preserved pre-existing Ming systems of administration and rewards. Under Manchu rule, the Chinese polity consisted of more than 20 distinct ethno-linguistic areas and incorporated parts of modern-day Mongo Mongolia, Turkestan, Tibet, Burma, Indochina, Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, and we get a sense of that historical geography here, the yellow, of course, being the Qing Manchu dynasty. And you can see the outer limits uh, or the boundaries of the empire, of course, this being Southeast Asia, modern-day Myanmar, the Korean Peninsula, further northeast. Population pressure and land concentration in fewer hands created problems exacerbated by famines and floods, poverty, rebellions, and government corruption, fiscal irresponsibility, and tax initiatives, all of which contributed to the exodus of thousands of Chinese. Further, despite the opposition of Chinese leaders, the cunning British managed to carve a space for themselves in China and develop an opium trade, devastating large sectors of the Chinese population in the process. When Emperor Dao Guang attempted to end the opium trade in 1838, the British responded with war. The ensuing Treaty of Nanjing opened ports to foreign commerce. Another opium war repeated the same types of circumstances in the 1850s and had similar effects. Social and economic turbulence in China coincided with labor demands emanating from Latin America and the Caribbean. From Brazil, Peru, and the United States to Cuba and Puerto Rico, government officials and planters debated whether Chinese workers could occupy the role left vacant by former slaves. With the expansion of the coolie trade, mainland Chinese traders held recruits in seaport depots in anticipation of selling their contracts to bidding companies. If contracts were not sold in China, then they were auctioned in host society ports. 
Upon her arriving in Havana, for example, coolies once again inhabited prison-like depots until they were finally distributed to hosting sugar mills. They principally lived and worked in the western provinces of Pinal del Rio, Matanzas, and Havana, which we see nestled to the left here, and in smaller numbers in the central and eastern provinces of Santa Clara, Puerto Príncipe, and Santiago, in the center and east part of the map. Regardless of where they resided and labored in Cuba, contracted Chinese contested their living conditions, the punishments they endured, and the terms of their contracts. They quarreled with and killed notionally white and colored plantation management, one another, and enslaved and free people of color. Runaway slave Esteban Montejo, whose historical memory was compiled in the 1960s, confirms Chinese laborers ki killed their overseers with a variety of weapons. The Chinese didn't trust anybody, he suggests, even when a master assigned an overseer of their own race to gain their confidence, they closed ranks. Coolies in, in Cuba acted in these ways, scholar Lisa Yoon argues, because they were aware of the very perverted nature of the contract institution. Contracted Chinese struck their targets in packs. For example, in December 1867 on La Maria Sugar Mill in Matanzas province, four tired coolies macheted to death a Creole black named Baltasar. Baltasar had threatened to report them as runaways. Fear of being punished in a way reserved for runaway slaves compelled many Chinese to take, or these Chinese to take, Baltasar's life. In the summer of 1870 on Fastesio Sugar Mill in Sagua La Grande, Santa Clara, three subversive colonos de la clase asiática stabbed to death an enslaved Creole black named Cristobal. Prior to the homicide, Cristobal and a coolie named Fabian had a heated exchange regarding the ownership of a short coat. Frustrated, Fabian and two other coolies attacked Cristobal with their spades. Historian Joseph C.